You're listening to Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. We're back for another episode of Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. Folks, today I have a new face before you, and this person is one of my clients. Now, she has been working on her healing journey for a long time, long before she met me, but the Lord put us together. And uh, since meeting Jan, I have had the pleasure of learning more data points than I had learned from all the other folks I've worked with because of her unique experiences. And lo and behold, she has a book inside of her and she is ready to talk. I am very excited to introduce you all to Jan, who has just the most incredible story. Jan, welcome to Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. Hi, Dan. Thank you so much for letting me tell my story. I've been waiting a long time to do this. Well, you know, it's my pleasure. Uh, our audience is just full of incredible people. And I have one of the few audiences, I think, in the world that can keep up with the testimonies and stories that survivors have. And, you know, we just really have a unique platform here at Bride Ministries for all of this. But, you know, Jan, you have a story that, like many survivors, begins right at the beginning, early in life. I want you to begin your introduction by telling us a little bit about the family that you were born into and some of the things you know about them. Well, my family to the outside world would look really, really normal. Uh, we were probably lower middle class, lived in small communities all my life. My dad worked construction work. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. So to every, all of our neighbors and people in our town, we probably looked really, really normal. And even to myself, I looked normal because I, I had so many memories, so much information was repressed. My life was kind of, um, I like to think of it as a three, like a three-layer cake. I had the outside layer that was conscious and, um, and knew just the normal, the normal life. The, the layer below that was uh, filled with a lot of sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And then there was a layer beyond that that was actually programming. And um, I believe now that my family was an Illuminati, is an Illum was, they're both uh, passed away now, my mother and father. But I believe they um, uh, were born into an Illuminati family. I was born into an Illuminati family. My father, I'm not sure about, but my mother, I know, was a multi-generational uh, Gnostic witch. And uh, her lineage goes back, uh, really, I believe, before Adam and Eve, which is, I know, I'm crazy, but um, that's really what's come out in my memory and my, my working through everything. So, um, my, my earliest memories are, are of a sexual abuse with my mother, and uh, I think this was a lot of her programming. Uh, I think it was done to her, and so she did it to me. A lot of it was about preparing me to be used sexually by men in the cult. Um, we belonged to a, um, a local cult, and I believe that was uh, my introduction into the deeper world of the Illuminati and the programming and the uh, government aligned control. So um, my earliest memories in the occult were, were of a uh, initiation ceremony. And I was a year and a half old. And so I was actually initiated into the local cult at that time. Um, then another, uh, my biggest memory that opened up for me um, access to my memories because when I when I, uh, in 1984, I, I had a depression, a really deep depression, and ended up having to go into the hospital to a mental health ward because I was just starting to have panic attacks. And when I got to the hospital, um, I had two memories come forth. One was my mother sexually abusing me. And um, the second one was of my father. 
And I think the two, the two memories actually linked up, but I didn't know that for years and years and years. I, I thought they were separate for a long time. Mm -hmm. But my mother abused me sexually and caused a bleeding injury. And when my dad uh, came home, she told him that I had been raped by a black boy that lived down the street. And we had, I lived in a town of 12,000 people. There was a small population of black, black people that lived down the street from us. But this black boy, I, you know, I never, he never raped me. But she told my father that. Now, just for the clarity of our listeners, mm -hmm. before we get into this story, which folks i'm telling you this story is intense mm -hmm. um you later in life went to a mental hospital where you got some memories mm -hmm. you said your first memories of abuse or your first memories happened in a year and a half when you were initiated into the cult but these memories that you got when you were in the mental hospital were those of a year and a half or later on in your life were you a little older than a year and a half with these memories? I was 34 years old when I went into the mental health unit of our local yeah. hospital. And at that point, I thought my parents were perfect. Mm. I thought I came from a perfect home. I had no memories of any abuse. Yeah. None. And so it was in the hospital that I, st I got my first two memories back. And they were both these memories that I'm talking about now. So they were the very first thing that, that started. Uh, and it was, it was really um, another six years before I started getting cult, cult memories that I could recognize as cult memories back. So I worked with a, a counselor for six years in therapy every week um, okay. and processed a few memories from my childhood, but they weren't, they weren't occult memories. There it is. The memories didn't even begin to bleed through till you were 34. So um, you were how old during this incident where your mother told your father it was the black boy? I was two and a half years old. Two and a half years old. What happened? So my father, I was injured. I was bleeding, bleeding I believe. My father took me to a local uh, hospital where I was treated. And he left me there. And when he came back, um, he had five men in our family were with him. A grandfather, a step-grandfather, a couple uncles, and a small uncle that was just a couple years older than I was. And uh, I was in, they put me in the car. We drove down to this, where this family lived, this black family lived. And they grabbed two boys. I believe they were teenagers. They weren't full-grown men yet. And they put them in the car and we drove and drove and drove outside of town and ended up in a wooded area. I remember there was a train track there. There was a bridge over a river there and they built a campfire and they brought the boys in. One of the boys got loose and ran into the woods and they shot after him. I don't know if he was killed, you know, or not. I, I've never known that. Um, but the other boy, they ended up torturing to death. Mm. Um, there was a lot of mutilation. Um, and the whole, during the whole time, it was, as if, it was as if they were including me in on their activities. They were all drunk, by the way, by this time. They were including me in as if what was being done to him was for my benefit. So at two and a half years, I was very, very, very confused as to why they were doing this to this boy. I knew he was in horrible, horrible pain. And I knew somehow it was because of me. And so, and they were at times laughing. Of course, he was screaming in pain. I was, I didn't know if I was supposed to, if it was supposed to be funny. I just, in my two and a half year old mind, I was, I just didn't know. I was very confused. In the end, my father had me stand on his chest and he had a shotgun and made me pull the trigger. And it was very, it was horrible. It was horrible. It was horrible. So they had a fire going 
and they uh, put his body on the fire. What was left of his head, my grandfather made me pick up and put in a bucket and he walked with me down to the river and we threw it in the river. My, all these guys just kept drinking the rest of the night until the fire burned out and the sun was coming up and um, we drove home. The next, I think the next day, my parents packed up and we left. We lived in Missouri. We left there and went out to the western part of Kansas. And the story, the story in the family was always that um, we went there on vacation and we stayed for five years. That was the, that's what we were told all my life, you know, all my life. But um, the, the interesting part is, now, after doing some research, I found out that the coroner of this town that this murder happened in what ended up being our cult leader. He was the high priest of our cult. And he became my programmer for my, my entire, as long as he was alive. So there are a lot more connections to him, you know, as, as time goes by. But, um, I found that when I was doing research of the time and who all was involved and so forth. Uh, my, my dad was never investigated that I know of. My dad ended up being um, uh, a leader, kind of a, I, almost more like the mafia, really, uh, a leader in this organization that he was in. It had Nazi roots, I know that. I know they did gun running and that, a lot of other things too. But, um, so that was my first, my second memory that came back. Yes. And um, yeah, the sexual abuse and then it had kind of, I think that memory had sealed the door, so to speak, to keep everything under wraps. And then, uh, then that was sort of the beginning of memory starting to come back, but it was very different. The first year, six years were very difficult for trying to retrieve memories because I was still so um, really locked up. Mm -hmm. Now tell us a little bit about where you were at in your life at 34. At 34, um, I had gotten married. I was married when I was 30 and uh, life was pretty good. My husband and I had some properties that we were managing and he had a good job and I had a good job and he had two daughters and they were in and out of the house a lot. Um, I had already traveled a lot in my life, had been a lot of places. Um, so everything was good, but this depression just came on that spring and it just got worse and worse and worse until it just, uh, I was finally almost in a catatonic state every day. Uh, my husband would go to work and I'd be sitting in the kitchen, drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes. He'd come home, I'd be sitting in the kitchen, drinking coffee and the cigarette ashtray would be, you know, a foot high. Oh my God. <laughs> I was still sitting there. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, with the family that you grew up in, you're telling us that there were some Nazi roots, some white supremacist stuff. Would you say that your family had connections to Germany? Um, my sister just did a genealogy thing, mm -hmm. uh, one of those mail-in deals. And um, she found out that my mother was Irish English and my father was German English. Mm. Both my mother and father have RH negative blood. Okay. I read about that. Um, my father had, I know that he had Nazi roots, but I can't, I can't trace that back. I don't know. I'm not sure where that came from. I just know from more recent memories that it was definitely there, but I don't see it on his father or his mother, but I'm not 100% sure that my mother and father that I knew growing up were really my parents in the first place. So <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> that is another story. And folks, you know, just to kind of point out just how relevant that comment is, I have found over and over and over again 
that when people are born into cult families, it is not uncommon for the conception mother to not even be the birth mother and the birth mother to not necessarily be the mother that raises the child. Sometimes there's a handoff more than once. It, 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 it's bizarre. It does sometimes involve high technologies that they, that because they transfer fetuses, as strange as that sounds. So things get really wonky and um, it takes a revelation of the Holy Spirit to work all the pieces together. Okay, Jan, let's talk a little bit about early memories with your father beyond this incident. Um, because you had a significant memory that you just told us about, which I know when it came, it was, it was tough. <laughs> and you're putting all of this in a book for us that will eventually get released. I'm very excited to say that, folks. Uh, Jan has uh, been in the process of composing a book. So, so look forward to that because she has a lot to say and, and she's writing it down. Um, but what are some of the memories you began to get about your father and his abuse. Okay. I have uh, probably the most significant memory I have about my father was um, my brother was born. He's younger than I am. My mother was at the hospital having had him. My father went, uh, was out visiting her one night and um, he came home from the hospital. The babysitter was there. So he took her home. When he came back, he was drunk. And uh, that wasn't anything real uncommon for him. But it was, it was night, we had already gone to bed, and he came in to me and asked uh, if I wanted to come get in bed with him because mom wasn't there. So in my, I was uh, seven years old, so never thought anything about it, went in. And so he starts having me play with his penis. And it was a curiosity to me. Uh, I'd never seen one. He wanted me to feel it, touch it, you know. It was just probably your normal scenario for a pedophile. And um, he ended up raping me that night. And uh, when I actually recovered this memory in the hospital, when it happened, I actually had all the physical feelings of it and I could feel my pelvic bones moving out. I didn't feel the pain, which was pretty curious to me. I couldn't figure that out for a long time, but I think it's that the pain was so severe that I went into shock immediately. I separated from my body. My, I, could, I could see my body on the bed. He left the room got sick, was in the bathroom. I could see my body on the bed. I could see the blood, but I could also see my body under the baby bed, which was in the same room. And I couldn't figure out where I was because I could see myself in both places. Mm. And um, he ended up coming back and pulled me out from under the baby bed, took me in the bathroom, um, put me in a bathtub full of hot water and um, was throwing up in the kitchen sink. Uh, when he left the bathroom, I tried to get out of the tub to lock the door um, and fell, hit my head. When I woke up from that, my grandfather was there, his father. And so uh, his father said, you need to go get the doctor. We had a chiropractic doctor who lived next door to us. So they ended up wrapping me in a blanket and taking me to his house. Um, he treated me overnight, and then I ended up going to my grandfather's house. And um, they told my mother that I had the flu because I was gone for several days. And it was in my grandfather's house that this coroner slash priest showed up. And he started hypnotizing me. And so I don't know if that was the, you know, if, if at that point they actually knew that I was going to be a chosen one, quote unquote, or if he was just the doctor in town and, and that was his, 
you know, regular mode of operation. This was like in the mid 50s. So um, I think a lot of the mind control and so forth was being, you know, was just coming on board pretty, pretty strongly about that time. So, um, so he, he hypnotized me and I think basically took that memory away through hypnosis so that, you know, it was gone. Well, folks, um, as you can see, Jan is an overcomer. Um, she's sitting here talking to me, but she has my, oh my, the story to tell. Um, we're just now at the very beginning and scratching the surface. But things that she shares, they are not isolated to her. Uh, this has gone on all over the country. Um, and there's always the surface story. And then there's everything that's beneath the surface that begins to come up, particularly when a person is brave enough to engage with a healing journey with Jesus. Now, Jan's been on a journey for some time. When she found me, we just uh, kicked it into a bit of a high gear. But as we were discussing, you know, how are we going to go about this storytelling and, and, and putting her information out there, we decided we were going to do a bit of a dual conversation, talking about what she knew at the surface and what she began to recover about the surface and then the deeper things. And so, Jan, we ran into a, 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 an internal cemetery and that has all kinds of connections and um, even gets into abortion and fetuses and things that happen. Can you explain to us what all was discovered as we ran into that? Well, as I recall, we were discussing souls uh, during that session. And you ask uh, one of my parts, I'm thinking it might've been Alice, um, trying to remember. One of, you asked one of my parts if there was a cemetery inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep, sure enough, there was. And it was outside of a little church. And I actually remember this little church, I think. It was in a little town not too far from where we lived. And I suspect now that there were probably cult, mem uh, cult meetings in that church. And it did have a cemetery outside. So um, sure enough, uh, Jesus was with us <laughs> on this journey. He usually comes along. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I saw the cemetery. And... Uh, when I first saw it, there was uh, there were just tombstones in it, and pretty soon flowers sprung up all around everywhere. And Jesus came through and broke down the names off of these tombstones. And then he tipped the tombstones over, and they became walkways, and these flowers became like a garden. And I knew that the spirits were leaving and going to heaven. And um, there was a story that went with this, uh, this cemetery. And the story was that when I was a child, little, my mother, my mother, I think, did a lot of abortions over the years. And she had performed an abortion on herself, I believe. And uh, she had uh, given, she had, this fetus that she gave to me and told me to go throw it in the trash. And I knew it was a baby. So I took it out under our side porch and I was going to keep it there safe. And after if, a few days, um, just for our listeners, how old do you believe that you were when this happened? I think I was probably eight or nine, maybe eight or nine, uh, but I already had parts by now. Yes. So I had parts functioning. So um, this, uh, this baby I ended up putting into a shoebox because I eventually I knew it was not going to come back. 
And I created this cemetery inside to take care of babies that I saw murdered over all the years. Mm -hmm. So as I saw in cult rituals and in my own home, babies that were aborted, I would, in my mind, internally, uh, take these babies in and give them a burial. And so Jesus came that day into the cemetery and um, brought healing, brought healing to that hole. Wow. Um, yes, and I remember because it was actually a part named John, who's now a good friend of mine because he talks to me when we're in sessions and all of that. And, and uh, he was also actively involved. Um, one of the interesting things about that whole experience was that this whole thing about death gets really interesting, especially in the cult. You know, we hear stories about things like the cult believing, look, if uh, we drink the blood of people that we kill, we get more power, we live longer. Sometimes they make sure that a person is in the room when a ranking witch dies so they can breathe in her last breath. So there's some kind of transfer of power. And it seemed like, and at least that's my curiosity was, that this cemetery may have played some kind of role like that relative to your life. I know that the souls are captured. And I've got a whole lot of stuff about that. Uh -huh. uh, um, I'm, I'm getting two things mixed up in my mind, uh, two different sessions, I would say, that we've done together about souls and, and death and so forth. I had a lot of death programming, mm -hmm. and I had a lot of death. Um, I just wanted, uh, most of my life, I just wanted to die, but I didn't know how to do that. I wanted my parents to die. I didn't know how to make that happen. So death became a place of safety for me. It's, it seems really strange to say that, but, but it was a place that I could go and just not exist. And so, um, so I think it's very possible that these children were parts of myself. I saw them as children outside of myself because I saw so many children die in the cult, in rituals. And um, there's another element to this whole story of um, a collection of souls from children from abortions that my dad was involved in. And this is something I've just recently found out about, that he actually went to abortion centers and collected the, the fetuses that were aborted. But I found out during that memory that demons are actually standing by to capture the souls of these children when they're aborted and then they're harvested. And that's, it's an area that is just new to me, but um, the Holy Spirit is really helping me to understand how that's worked through, you know, many, many, many years. And so, um, yeah. Right. And it gets so uh, intricate when, we're, when, when you're working through this stuff, because it's like, what, what went where and just how complex is this? You know, one of the interesting things that I, I think um, people need to understand is it, it, there's a lot of people that have had abortions or, or done this, and they will see their child in heaven with Jesus. God will actually show them. Or, you know, there was a miscarriage or whatever. Sometimes people that have been involved in cults will wonder, like, well, where are these babies, you know, and, and they'll have a vision and they'll see the baby in heaven. And then they come back to the Bible and what it says in um, First Samuel, you know, when David lost his first child and he says, you know, he cannot come to me, but I will go to him. The idea that David was going to meet him um, first in Abraham's bosom and then in heaven that that would have been collected. And so we have a very simplistic view of what happens when, you know, things like abortions take place. But 
what we don't always take into account is fragmentation of the soul in the process of an abortion or a, um, you know, something like that, a birth and then ritual killing of a, a child. Or if it's induced early, then the fetus that comes out and then ritually killed. You know, there's a fragmentation that occurs. And because the soul is able to be split, it's like pieces of the soul are captured by the demons. Some of it may be taken to heaven, but not the hundred percent of it like we would like to assume and so in essence both perspectives have truth to them and we run into this and then uh we were running into the question of wait a minute and this was the one that really got us messed up jan i was asking jesus what about the spirit if the souls are being partially captured as the fragments are going Maybe your angels are getting pieces of them and taking those to heaven. Okay, great. What about their human spirit? What happens to, to those? And we got back some interesting things, which seem to fall right in line with Ecclesiastes 12.7. I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to let you tell us what, what you were getting when all of this was transacting. But, but Ecclesiastes 12.7 says, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Um, not really delineating between different types of people, just saying almost matter of fact, oh, the spirit just goes back to God. Anyway, this is very interesting. So Jan, go ahead and tell us what you remember. Yeah, I remember this now because uh, you were asking me, me about the spirit because I told you that that I had seen my, my aborted child in heaven. And so I knew that the spirit went back to heaven, but the soul, um, we, you start kind of asking more and more questions about that. And I sort of went into the, this realm where the information was getting downloaded to me, but it was, it was a hard download. And um, so anyway, what I got was that the, the soul is actually used by Satan for energy, that the energy of the soul that he captures become um, like little energy factories or little battery storage batteries where he actually siphons off this energy for his kingdom and for the operations that he's doing within his kingdom. And that uh, eventually those lead to death. Death is like a black hole um, now, correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong, because <laughs> when this came to me, I felt like I was operating on a whole different dimension. You know, it was hard for me to even, it was hard for me to stay there in the, in the moment, because uh, I kept wanting to come back to three-dimensional thinking or something, I don't know. But, um, but, but what, I think I wrote about it a little bit later, too, was that uh, what I, the way I understood it that day was that the souls are captured. They're, they're used in Hades and hell for energy. Eventually they go into a black hole, which is death. And that becomes Satan's and Satan's been accumulating and building that for millennia. Does that sound right? <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the interesting things is that, um, and I, and I will say this, when we've done city intercession, you know, um, we were dealing with something known as the armies of the dead, uh, which surprisingly be, is a real issue. And uh, we were doing this corporately and uh, we ran smack dab into the abortion agenda. And what we ran into during the city intercession was that they had used the soul fragments of many aborted fetuses in order to gridlock evil agendas into the city itself. And so we found ourselves trying to unravel some of that, you know, with the angels and with Jesus during this intercession for the city. Um, there's no one in the world that's going to tell me that abortion is God's best for anyone, period. Um, there's no one in the world that's going to tell me that, you know, a pro-choice is a real position that a righteous person can stand on. 
uh, because I, I have just become aware of so much that the evil kingdom powers up with infant sacrifice. And um, the, 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 it, it's not just about the blood that's shed at the event. It's about what they're doing with what they can harvest afterwards. Um, they're running agendas against cities. They're running agendas against nations. They're running agendas against people groups. And they are powering it up with abortion and ritual killings of infants. So Jan, we ran into quite a bit on this one. We did. <laughs> yeah, well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so moving on, uh, you know, th there, there was another day that we were doing some work and it was it, just a lot going on, right? And um, we ran into a school. So I met one of your parts and told me about a school. I had a really, really bad feeling about it. And I, I want to have you talk about this because the fact of the matter is one of the things that people don't really understand well is the connection between people's individual or personal brokenness and uh, cosmic structures of bondage that the kingdom of darkness maintain and how those cosmic structures of darkness influence physical earth in a large scale and how everything is actually interconnected. In other words, one person's deliverance can cause a shift in a city because their breakthrough is a collapse of a demonic structure anchored in the heavenlies over the city. And it's like, we often can't, we're not trained to think this way as a body of Christ. So we actually will put personal deliverance in one category and we'll put citywide intercession in another category. We, we tell you know, ourselves that they're two separate things. You know, and, 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 and unfortunately, a lot of people that do intercession, you know, for their region or territory are not involved in deliverance and inner healing ministry. And a lot of people that are in deliverance and inner healing ministry don't really get into the citywide intercession per se, because, I mean, technically, in a lot of cases, these folks don't really fit in. <laughs> they don't really fit in with the people that have taken up up, you know, on the shoulders to, to, to go ahead and pray for the city, and, you know, so you find different things in different areas, whatever. But, but what we're realizing is that everything is deeply interconnected. And you have a story of, of, of something that we encountered in you and in your system, which is your internal world, um, that really communicates well on this subject. So um, this time I was talking to a part named Alice. She came forward and she told me about uh, a school on the inside. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Alice, who she is, and then talk to us about what happened as you remember it. Yeah, Alice, Alice, I had met Alice years and years and years ago when I first met my parts, but I had forgotten who she was. And when she came forth that day, I was surprised. And I'm like, oh, no, who is this? <laughs> because I couldn't really remember talking with her. It had been so many years. And, uh, but then it came to me that she was, uh, she was my best friend in kindergarten. So she was named after my friend Alice in kindergarten. And um, you asked her where she lived. Well, first you gave her the bread of life like you normally do and the living water and asked her what she was wearing and you know, you have a pattern that you're following. So then you ask her, well, where do you live, Alice? And she said, I, I live in a red schoolhouse. And I'm along for the ride now because I don't know any of this. So I'm just like, okay. So um, you say, well, uh, can we go in? And she says, well, yeah, we have to ring the bell. And so I'm seeing all of this unfold as it's happening. And I see a bell on a big post and it's about 20 feet in front of this red schoolhouse and there's like a little stoop with stairs coming down and when she rings the bell I see a, a person come out of the schoolhouse and he's he he reminds me of an Ichabod Crane character 
He was very tall, really skinny. He had on a black coat that was more like a, um, almost like a tuxedo coat or a long waistcoat maybe. His, uh, he had dark hair and just a very strange looking character. He, did, he, he looked human, kind of, but he was strange looking. And he was standing at the front door. So you ask Alice if we could go in. And she said, yeah, so we went in. And the first thing I saw was all this wooden, old fashioned wooden school desk. There was a huge chalkboard. There was a wooden table where this, this guy was. And there were about 12 children in the room. So you gave um, Alice a basket full of bread and asked her to distribute it to the children, which she did. And I could, now I'm hearing you're talking, I'm hearing my thoughts, I'm hearing Alice's thoughts, <laughs> and watching this as it unfolds. And so after she distributed the bread to all the children, you ask her to give um, a loaf to the, or, or you ask this, the, uh, the man what his name was, and he said his name was Schoolmaster. And all I heard was master. And I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> I was already starting to freak out because he had on this white shirt with a black suit. And black and white to me anytime means Mingala because I was programmed with Mingala programming. And black and white is, you know, pro proliferate in that programming. So I was already sort of on edge about that. So he said his name was Schoolmaster. So you asked Alice to give him a loaf of bread, and she did, and he dropped it in the trash can beside his desk. <laughs> and when that, when I heard it hit the the bottom of the trash can, I heard you powering up in prayer <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> and, and at the yep. same time, I heard you powering up in prayer. I saw him pull a whip from behind his back and it was a long like a carriage whip it was it was wicked looking and I'm like hurry up Dan <laughs> we haven't got much time <laughs> because this guy was getting ready to lash out <laughs> I knew he was gonna wipe everybody out and so by this time you are powered up and you ask the angels to bind him I think hit hand and foot I think if I remember right and you asked the angels to usher the children out of the schoolroom, and they did. And Jesus was there, on right on time. <laughs> and <laughs> and you asked the angels to make this guy kneel to Jesus yep. at his feet. And uh, yeah, and when he did, suddenly I I went from watching him and the scene to being inside of him. And I can feel myself resisting, bowing before Jesus. I, just, I could feel that struggle. I could feel the internal struggle. And um, about, this, <laughs> about this time, everything in the room started flying around the room. I mean, anything that was loose was in a, like a whirlwind around this room. So the man, I'm, I'm back outside of the man now, and the, the angels have the man. He's standing up, and he's bowed at Jesus' feet already. So you started questioning him of who he was. And um, I think he said he was part of the Dirty Dozen. And um, I'm trying to remember all the steps of this. Well... Uh, the, 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 the Dirty Dozen was a committee of 12. And they would come to the school to discuss projects for the next month. And those projects involved, well, different kinds of things. And so... Um, Yes. So you sent the angels out to collect the dirty dozen. And I saw in the spirit, I saw them go to an area in China. And so the dirty dozen were brought back 
They were put in prison. I think you asked that they be put in prison. And so I saw a pit. The dirty dozen were put in the pit. There was a grate over the top of the pit. And you said, do you see Jesus? And I saw Jesus sitting on a wooden bench right at the top of the pit, looking down into the pit. <laughs> what I call it justice. You know, many times it's the believers that feel like they're in the pit with the demon standing on top of them. Uh, we like to flip the script. Anyway. <laughs> 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 so you ask me to ask Jesus what should be done with the dirty dozen. And Jesus said, have him interrogate them one by one. I knew by now these were not humans. These were alien beings or some kind of spiritual beings. They weren't human. I think I knew at that time they were alien. And I'm like, well, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> so I heard you powering up again, and you started praying in tongues. And it was a, a, what I call a diver's tongues. And I heard it one other time in another session that we had. And the, the funny thing for me was that it's, it's like I knew the language. I knew I recognized mm. the tongue that you were praying. Wow. And it was, it was comforting to me for some reason. I don't know why, but I was comforted by it. And I was just listening. And then it, it got even more interesting because I could hear their answers. I could hear them saying back uh, telep uh, through telepathy. You know, it was just, I didn't hear, hear them speak it. I just, in their mind, I heard their mind. And that they were, um, they were stationed along the Silk Road, and they traded in children. From the kings of the earth would bring children to them. And as they were telling this, my mind was thinking about all the children um, that are traded. You know, it was just coming to the forefront in our own news about all the, the trading of children in our own country. And so that was really, I, I was just really kind of starting to grieve about that whole thing, imagining all these children being brought to these guys and collected along this Silk Road. And uh, it came to me later, though, that, that it wasn't, at first I thought it, were, it was orphans and children that were abandoned or that they, you know, kidnapped or whatever. But what came to me later in prayer and working through all of this was that these are children from the kings of the earth. Mm -hmm. They bring their children here to be taken off planet for training so that they can take their positions as kings of the earth. So, so, so before we go any further, uh, folks, here's what's happening in a nutshell. There is a school building that's on the inside of Jan. Uh, I would say probably somewhere within the realm of the subconscious. And it exists there as a structure. And Jan has parts, namely Alice and others, that reported to that school regularly the schoolmaster was one of a committee of other beings that had access through back doors, portals, and whatever else, their interdimensional highways to come in and out of Jan subconsciously in, her, in that area of her subconscious to have meetings and to develop their programs. Um, and so this group of this committee was not only interfacing with Jan's subconscious, but also dealing with the geography of the earth known as the Silk Road. Even though Jan is over here in the United States, this is how some of this stuff begins to be, um, maybe we can use the term quantumly entangled. It's 
it's it's just very interesting the way it plays out. But this is we haven't gotten to the whole story. So so they told us that they only trade in gold, and that they would take these children, and of course this would be their souls or soul parts to the school. And then what would happen, Jan? And then, um, well, I think we came back. We, let's hear. I, you prayed that the children, the, that these soul parts would be brought back and, and brought back for redemption and healing and so forth. But um, the brother, or the, um, the schoolmaster, you, you questioned him. And he, was, he had a brother that lived on Sirius. And the story came out from him that the two brothers had had a fight and that the one brother was uh, basically uh, sent to Earth to do this job as schoolmaster and his brother's still on Sirius. And so um, you sent the angels out to gather that brother up. <laughs> and brought the two brothers and bound them together and they ended up in another pit. <laughs> and once that was done, I noticed that there was a gate on the back of the school. And I think that's when we realized that there, that, that was a portal. And um, I forget that you prayed, that maybe that's when you prayed then that the children that would all be brought back from where they had been scattered throughout the cosmos and prayed for that and prayed for the destruction of that portal. And uh, have I missed anything? Um, you're doing very good, Jan. Okay. Great, great work. Yes. So, <clears throat> so this revelation with the brother, however that makes sense, mm -hmm brought everything now to another level because what we began to see is that your system was tied to the Silk Road, which was tied to the soul trade, which is mentioned in the book of Revelation as a component of the kingdom of Babylon, who trades in the bodies and souls of men, according to a Revelation chapter 17. They trade in the bodies and souls of men. And here we see that your programming is implicated in that. And there is a tie to the Sirius star system. So you have Sirius in the heavens, the Silk Road in the earth, and you all involved in this thing. And so then, you know, we did the only uh, practical thing, which was ask Jesus, how should we punish them? <laughs> he he said, the 12 in the pit, you ask how, what we should do with them. And Jesus said, drop a millstone on them. <laughs> so I saw this gigantic millstone just dropped right on top of them. And <clears throat> they just turned to dust instantly. It's like just done, done. There's another part of this story, Dan, that we haven't discussed yet. And it came in a memory that I had a few days after this. And the, mem and the memory, this was just part of, an of another memory. But the part that hooks in with this story is that underneath this schoolhouse was a factory that processed souls. And my father was involved in that. And um, so this is all new information for me, but um, he actually had a route that he went to pick up fetuses from uh, abortion clinics in a several state area, I think. And the, when the memory came back, it was told to me that the souls are captured as these babies are aborted. The souls are captured by demons. The demons bring the soul parts or soul fragments back to this factory and that they are harvested there and shipped out to places in the cosmos. My dad would actually make the rounds, I believe in the physical, and collect the fetus bodies 
and bring them back. And they were dealing with those for occultic purposes because there is a, a big element of um, eating the flesh uh, in the occult. And so that's, I believe that they were harvested and sold for those purposes. And my dad, I think, was deeply involved in that, in that uh, job. And that was under the schoolhouse that we worked on in our session. So it was another level, another level. And I don't know if that was another portal that, um, that went to an underground something or if that was just, uh, you know, part of the, part of the uh, spiritual dynamic of, you know, the level, the same level. Hmm. No. Well, folks, welcome to the reality of undoing what the devil has done. Now, you mentioned Mengele, and I, though we didn't plan to, to broach this subject today, but since you brought it up, I do want to have you talk about this a little bit, mm -hmm. your experience with Mengele. Now, what we do know is that after World War II, many Nazis went different places. Some of them came to the US through Project Paperclip, others of them went to Russia through a different project. Others of them went to Antarctica. Some of them went to South America. Many people assume that Mengele was among those that went to South America, but may have very well contracted with the CIA or other organizations. However, he did it. There are a lot of people in the US that have experiences of being programmed by Mengele post-World War II. And in that, however that worked out, you have memories of being programmed by the angel of death, Mengele himself. And I want to just let you talk about what you know about that um, and, and where those memories of being programmed by him pick up. Yeah, it's like so many of my memories, it's kind of a patchwork quilt. So you get a piece here and you know, five years later, you get another piece and they both fit together and then you see that little piece of the puzzle. And so it's just been, it's been that way all for the 34 years of my journey so far. It's been, I'm just collecting pieces from here, there and everywhere. And then eventually they start making a, a story or a picture. So my first memory that came back of Mengele was, um, I think I was about nine or 10 years old, maybe this is the first memory that came back. This isn't my earliest memory, but it's the first memory that came back to me. And I was um, supposed to be going to a, a church um, camp. And there were a whole bunch of us kids and we were on a bus and uh, something broke on the bus. So we were stalled out on a country road. And um, actually the, the programmer, my local programmer and my handler, what his wife was on that bus. He wasn't on there, but his wife was on the bus and she was a nurse. Mm. And so they started to take all the children off the bus. And I just went into a panic. I, I just kind of freaked out and she had to give me a shot to, to calm me down. And when I woke up, I was in a hospital setting and it was a room with uh, probably 30 beds, a long, narrow room had windows all along one side, and I could see doctors walking back and forth in the hallway outside those windows. And um, that, I believe this was a programming center near Colorado Springs, Colorado, that I was taken. For years and years and years, I thought I was only taken there one time, but it's only recently I found out I was taken many times which would make more sense because I had pretty extensive programming by him. So um, and that's where my initial, uh, well, that's where the formal programming began with him. But recently I've had memories when we lived in Kansas and I was only five years old. So I was in kindergarten, the same as the Alice memory. I had my tonsils out and I was, after my tonsils were out, I was taken into a back room and there was a man there that put, a, I call it a halo on my head. 
and um, did something. It was electronic. And uh, I think that maybe that's when I, cre I created a, a hell inside of me. And I was always trying to get rid of hell, but I knew that hell was in there. So I suspect that that might have been Mingala. It could have been him or it could have been the local doctor. But I was also taken to a man there in Kansas who taught one of my parts German. So uh, I don't know if the local doctor knew German or not, uh, which makes me think it might have been Mingala. Um, I was also there in, in, when I was five. Uh, some man came to our house and started doing programming with a jar, a jar of marbles, different colors, and he was doing some color programming on me. So um, I think that's when really the the mind control programming started was when I was about five. And if that was Mengele, then I was, I was involved with him at a pretty early age. Now, just recently uh, in that, that memory that I just spoke about a minute ago, uh, it was told in that memory that my dad actually knew Mengele quite well, that they were drinking buddies. So I don't know. I, I haven't been able to check out to see if Mengele was a drinker or not. I don't remember him drinking in any of my memories that I have of him. But um, I had in 80, well, uh, let's hear, it would have been in um, 90. In 90 is when I first met my parts. And um, they all started doing a lot of artwork. And there was a lot of artwork that they did that was Mingala uh, inspired. I didn't know that at the time. I had no idea that Mingala was part of my history. But looking back now, I can connect those, you know, the, the artwork to, to the history. So, yeah. Talk Mingala. about the black-white connection to Mangala as it relates to your experience. At one of those earliest pictures was of, of a keyboard, mm. a piano keyboard. And it had a little stick figure with a top hat. And he was dancing on this keyboard. And uh, when I started finding out about Mingala, I, I knew, I, I think one of the first clues I had was that this guy that programmed me was a piano player. He was an entertainer. He, and he was, I also had a part that um, when I met the part, she was sitting on a wall and she had a daisy and she was pulling off the leaves of the daisy saying, I love you, I love you not, I love you, I love you not. And at the time, I had no idea that that had, you know, it didn't mean anything to me at the time because I was still so blocked. My memories were still so blocked, but that was actually something that he did. That was a typical uh, thing that he did for programming. And basically what it was, was that if, if he pulled that last pedal off, I love you not, then someone got killed and you were always afraid when you went to him that you were going to be the one that got that pedal and so that was just um i think it was just used to terrorize and to set the stage for the programming that was coming so but i have a lot of other uh, i had a lot of other pictures of black and white became a real theme and a lot of the artwork uh that i knew later that i knew that were mingled up um, black and white, I think, goes back to the Masonic Lodge, which... Checkerboard floor, yeah. Oh, I also want you to talk about something that we ran into that was really interesting. Disney-themed programming. Uh, specifically, I believe we ran into something that was Mickey Mouse and something that was Donald Duck. Not Donald Duck, but Mickey Mouse was uh, I have a part which is a very uh, early, very one of the very earliest parts in my system was named Mickey Mouse. And uh, so I've done a little bit of work in that area and it appears that there was, um, Mengele was involved, I believe, even at, the con at my conception. And uh, somehow this Mickey Mouse uh, part goes back to the time of conception. And I haven't put all those pieces together completely. But my mother had a, a movie projector when I was little. 
and she had um, a, an eight millimeter film, and it was called uh, Steamboat Willie, who was the precursor to Mickey Mouse. He was, and I remember she, <laughs> we didn't have a place to set up. She would set the, the projector up in the bathroom and show it on the bathroom wall, the movie. And we would watch that movie over and over and over again. I hated that movie. I hated that cartoon. But she would show it over and over and over. And I wonder now if that wasn't uh, just reinforcement for programming that had already been put in. So I do know that I do have a Fantasia. I can't watch Fantasia to this day. I, I, I would like to see it, but I just, I can't go there. And uh, <laughs> Disney, yeah. My gosh. All right. So pressing rewind and coming back to growing up, of course, on the surface, you had no idea any of this was going on. What was your experience with your brother, who was probably also being targeted? My brother, um, I don't know to what extent my brother was really targeted. My sister, I know, has been programmed because she triggers me every time we talk. Mm -hmm. And I was pro primarily programmed with Wizard of Oz was a lot of my the big programming early on but she will um, she uses a lot of the um, um, oh I can't think now um, Alice in Wonderland themes she'll send me pictures with themes of Alice in Wonderland and so forth so uh, she actually dated the uh, the cult leader's son and was taking, taking on trips with them so i'm fairly we've never we've never talked about our history um and everything was so totally separated from consciousness and we li it's like we lived a jekyll and hyde existence the whole family lived it the whole family was dissociated and amnesic to what went on from hour to hour, it seemed like. Things could happen, and an hour later, nobody even knew they happened. It was so, it was such a complete, um, you know, barriers to, to our consciousness. So my, my brother and I have never discussed it with my brother. I don't think he was programmed to the extent that my sister and I were. Mm -hmm. um, but but I don't know that for sure because we've never discussed it. So. And um, one of the most difficult seasons of your life happened when you remember being locked in the basement for a period of time by your mom following what seems to be a little bit of acting out on your behalf. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what transpired there and, and, and how that impacted your shattering and the, 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 the dissociation that was taking place. Mm -hmm. This was after my dad had raped me. I went kind of crazy. I mean, I was acting out in all kinds of ways. I, I did a lot of fire starting when I was a child. So I was setting the birdcage on fire. You know, I was, I was doing all kinds of things. My mother had just had a baby and I don't think she was in the best emotional condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, she couldn't control me, and I was getting more and more out of control every day. So she started locking me in the basement when I'd come home from school so that at least she didn't have to deal with all the behaviors that was going on. And um, I had already split, and um, I had a presenter part. And the presenter part, because I was so lonely and I was in the basement every day, and this went on for months, I think the rest of that school year, which would have been probably five months. Um, so this presenter part needed a friend. So she created John, the one you mentioned earlier. And so she and John would talk back and forth, but the presenter gradually got more and more and more depressed and finally just shut down. And it was traumatic for John because John 
John was new, <laughs> you know, a new part. And here, his only friend is gone. And it was a, it was, it was a self betrayal. It was, it was the deepest, hardest on an emotional level. It was a very, very hard thing. It was a complete abandonment of self really. And, uh, it was, I asked the Lord one time about memories because I was always afraid I wouldn't be able to handle memories. And he said that was really the worst of everything, that that was the worst, the deepest wounding happened when I betrayed myself. I had already separated from my mother, soul, you know, as in a soul connection with my mother, I believe when I was two years old. And when my dad raped me at seven, I, I severed that relationship. So I had no bonding with either parent. And so I was essentially, I, I, I was an orphan. Mm -hmm. And then when I betrayed my own self, then John ended up uh, being uh, alone, totally alone in the basement every day. And um, this I can't go into it today, but the story gets really interesting many, many years later. Mm -hmm. uh, we got abducted and John was left in control of the body, which he had never been. And uh, so a lot of that stuff got triggered back up at that time. The loneliness. Yeah. And, you know, that's such a, an intriguing idea for many people to consider because it was certainly true in your case. But when it comes to dissociation, the ideas of self-hatred, self-contempt, self-abandonment, self-betrayal are root issues for many people. And it happens in the context of dissociation. And the unfortunate thing is, since we don't understand dissociation, we can't get to the root of the issues of self-betrayal when people have it and are dissociated, it, it just remains completely buttered over and with ignorance, not, not necessarily intentional, sometimes intentional, but, you know, and, and it's just such a key is what it is truly, Jan, that, that testimony, which you just shared is actually a key. Some people are looking for a breakthrough. They're like, I just can't get past this. Have you considered the possibility of self-betrayal and self-abandonment? And so uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's just a really, really important. And I, I'm glad and thankful that you shared that. And, um, you know, when it, when it comes to like wh where this all goes, I mean, goodness gracious, you know, here you are as a kid, you're, you're being put in isolation. I mean, they, they use this to literally cause people to go mad um, this is the abuse you're going through. And yes, you did survive it, but it came at a high price. Okay. Um, do you remember what life was like after that season ended? Um, well, there was a lot more that uh, actually in the basement, besides just being alone all the time, my mother was abusing me in the basement and she I believe was abusing my sister upstairs because I could hear my sister screaming a lot and there's a little story I'd like to tell if, if I can go that way we had a, a the woman that owned our house lived on second floor and she was an elderly lady and um, I would get to go up there and talk to her occasionally and she was just a sweet a sweet old lady and one day I told her that I was that mom was locking me in the basement and oh my gosh, she got so upset. And she said, Oh my gosh, she can't do that. She can't do that. There could be a fire. You couldn't get out. And which just put more panic in me. Cause I'm like, Oh my gosh, I can't get out. There's a fire. And we had a big furnace down there and we had, I had all these fire memories, which I didn't have at that time, but they were there. They were unconscious. And so it just added a whole new layer of, of terror <laughs> to being locked in the basement. But um, she, I had a chemistry set, and my mom let me take the chemistry set downstairs, so I entertained myself with that, mostly trying to develop poison to poison the whole family. That's what I was working on every day. 
So she, the woman upstairs, gave me some little perfume bottles. <laughs> they were tiny, little miniature ones. And uh, she told me that uh, God would collect all my tears and keep them in a bottle. And that was so, I don't know, it's like that one little act of kindness somehow allowed me to go through that period of time without really totally abandoning myself forever, really, I think. Oh, but um, I ended up taking those perfume bottles <laughs> <laughs> and I thought they would come in really handy to make to put that poison in once I got it worked out, the formula, you know. <laughs> so when I told my mom that I was making poison and I had the bottles to put it in, I lost the bottle collection. <laughs> she threw them all away and took the chemistry set away too. So <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well I'm glad we can laugh about it now. <laughs> um but then again, can't blame you. Mm -hmm. How did you find Jesus? Wow. Well, <laughs> it wasn't a one-time deal. <laughs> when, uh, when my dad took me to the hospital when I was two years old, when my mom had injured me, it was a, a Catholic hospital. And after they treated me, there was a nun that carried me, and we were walking up and down this hallway. She was just carrying me and trying to soothe me and calm me down. And we stopped, and there was a picture of Jesus on the wall. And I can't explain it, but in my heart, I connected with him that day. And it was that night that my father murdered the black boy and I think sold his soul into the cult. Mm. And I have always felt like it was the Lord's provision for me that I met him before that night was over. But we were in church when I was young. We'd go to, we'd go to cult meetings on Saturday night and church on Sunday morning which is not unusual for people who are, yeah. So um, I was, I went forward and was baptized because my mother got baptized, but I didn't really, uh, I didn't really feel anything particular that time. But a, few, a couple years later, we had a missionary come to school and talked about the missionary field. And then I got a, a, a call of God on my heart and I knew that I, I knew that I was supposed to work for God. <laughs> I was about 10 when that happened. And then um, my husband passed away in 1993. We were both atheists. I became an atheist in college. I don't know why. I really don't know why yet, but I worked really hard at it mm -hmm. so that I would not believe in God at all. It took me about three years to get him washed out of my brain. I mean, I did it deliberately. It was horrible. So I was an atheist for all those years. And then my husband passed away, and I started searching again. And um, and I, I found the Lord. My aunt and I were visiting one day across a kitchen table, and a demon manifested in my chest. And she was a, a pretty newborn Christian. She wasn't that old in the Lord. But um, I just looked at her, and I just said, help, because <laughs> this thing was, I thought it was going to kill me. And thank the Lord, she knew how to pray for deliverance, and I got delivered from it. And she said, okay, now, pray after me. <laughs> so, she, so she took me through the sinner's prayer, and inside of me, there were about 200 parts that were going, no, 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 you can't do that. No, stop, 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 stop. But Jesus got his foot in the door. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. <laughs> So that was the beginning of my being born, really being born again, voluntarily, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then over a period of another two or three years, I, I gradually came more and more and more into his arms. And, 
It's been wonderful ever since. He told me there was only one way out of this mess, and that was to follow him. And Come so I've tried to do that ever since. Come on. Yeah. That is so good. Well, I have a lot more that I want to have you share, John. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll be doing subsequent follow-ups in order to get to all of that. Um, for this particular podcast, is there anything that you want to add to what you've said thus far to leave people with? Well, I guess, I guess I would want to encourage survivors wherever you're at in the journey. Jesus is the only way out. Mm -hmm. I know that. <laughs> Nobody else has the answers. I told somebody one time early on in my recovery that it's like having three 1,000 piece puzzles taking them out of the box, dumping them all on a table, and trying to work the puzzles without the picture. That's what it felt like. And when Jesus told me that there's only one way out, and he knows the way, even the cult, even the programmers, even the people that put the programming inside of me don't know how to get it out. They didn't plan on it ever coming out. Right. So Jesus, but Jesus knows the way out. He knows every step. He knows the order of the steps and he knows how to bring healing. That is complete healing, not just partial. So follow Jesus. Amen. Well, Jan, I am uh, very, very proud of you. First mm -hmm. of all, you are so brave. One, to engage in a healing journey. And two, to talk about it. So thank you for being brave enough to come on the program and begin sharing elements of your story. Uh, we will be doing follow-ups to this um, to talk about some of the other aspects. Twinning, um, Denver Airport, uh, other subjects that are relevant to your story that really shed light on things, um, even including uh, some of this voice to skull technology and different other things that were used and you were used in. So. Folks, um, meet Jan and uh, look forward to the book that she is writing um, because it will be released at some point. I don't know if next year or if you're shooting more for 2020, but we will be making an announcement when that comes out. And with that said, folks, until next time, God bless and Godspeed. You've been listening to Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. If you would like to connect with us at Bride Ministries or to support what we are doing financially, visit us at www.bridemovement.com.